Welcome everybody. Um, welcome to uh, this webinar today, which is focused in on on Ghana and you know looking at our collective strengths to promote civic leadership in this in these extraordinary times. And just like uh, everywhere around the world, Ghana itself is also facing um, similar challenges with the current pandemic. My name is Eileen Alma, and I'm joined today by Basharatu Kamal in Ghana, who is our co-facilitator. We're going to be leading a discussion today um, to talk a little bit with all of the Cody graduates coming from Ghana um, about, about these times and how we can collectively help to move things forward. Um, if you haven't uh, already done so, please um, add to the group chat your name um, and where you're working and what year you graduated from Cody, if you did graduate, um, and, uh, and share a little bit more about yourself. I'm just going to uh, advance the slide here to say that if this is your first time using Zoom, there are some basic uh, buttons along the bottom for you to follow on. There's a a mute and an unmute button there. There's also your ability to turn your video um, on and off as well. Um, and if you have questions or you want to raise a point um, when we get time for the into the discussion period, you can raise your hand if you'd like. Um, there's all we're also using the chat box, and you know, feel free while we're having discussion, um, especially if you're having trouble with your microphone, to add in your own. Um, comments, interventions in the chat box as well. All of that will be captured and we will have that as a record from the, uh, for this webinar. I do want to also tell you that we are recording the webinar today so that we uh, have the ability to share it with people that may not have had the, the internet access today to join us and so that we can um, have a broader discussion. So you should be able to see uh, most of you um, a number of wonderful faces on your screen uh, of people that are joining um, participants and you should also be seeing um, slides that I will be going through and at some point I'm going to turn those slides off so that all we see are just faces and we can talk to each other a bit more. So welcome again. Uh, and you. I've already said here um, to add your name and your organization to the chat. Thank you for doing that. Um, and um, right now, what I'm going to ask you, unless you're one of the, you're a co-facilitator, which is Bash and I right now, to make sure that your um, your microphones are muted for now. Um, and if you have any questions, don't forget you can raise your hand for it. If you have any trouble during the call and you get kicked off the call, just note that we, you know, keep trying to come back on. Um, and know again that we're recording this today so that we can share it with you. If you also have any other technical issues or you want to share some of your comments or feedback, you can also email us at womenlead at sanefx.ca. Um, that's the same uh, email that you should have um, received the Zoom information from as well. And Kate is monitoring that for us today, Kate Thompson. Um, and, and yes, we are recording. So I'm going to stop there to say, first of all, hello, everybody. I'm Eileen Alma. I think I've met many of you when you come through the Cody Institute. I'm the Director of Women's Leadership and Indigenous Programming here at Cody. And I will be co-moderating today, or uh, co-facilitating today's discussion. But the real star of the, of the hour is uh, my <laughs> dear friend, Bash. And Bash, I'm going to turn it to you to say who you are and a little bit about you. Hi everyone, my name is Bashira Tukamal. I'm a diploma graduate 2017, had a great time at Cody. Um, I work with a trade union, I'm a trade unionist, I work as a gender and labor expert and also a part of the women's movement in Ghana. Thank you. Thanks Bash and it's so wonderful to have you on this and we've been talking for the, at least the last week a little, uh, with with your colleagues, Elham uh, Mamuni, who's also on the call today, and Professor Atia Abusignan, who could not join us today, but, is, but was helping prep us and, and having a, a pre-conversation ahead of the webinar. So, Prof, we're thinking about you today, as we know you're traveling to Accra. So, yes. we'll just move on. Gord Cunningham is our Executive Director at Cody, and he's also on the line, and I'm gonna to turn to him just to say a couple words of welcome, Gord. Thanks, Eileen, and, and thank you, Bash. Um, really looking forward to, to hearing from all of you. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone in Ghana. Um, good, afternoon. Good, af good afternoon, uh, or I should good say good morning, morning to Cody morning. colleagues. Um, and uh, even earlier morning, or at least maybe slightly later morning, I think Abdul Wahid is in Newfoundland, if I'm not mistaken, going to school. Um, this is uh, as one of a series of webinars that Cody uh, colleagues, along with uh, Cody alumni, have jointly uh, put together. We think it's really, really important in this time of of um, pandemic, of you know, these unprecedented times, and where a lot of the face-to-face -face contact has stopped, that we continue connecting with alumni um, all over the world to hear about how they're doing, um, how they're responding, their organizations are are responding, how the communities um, that in which they work are are dealing with the crisis, what are the challenges they're facing, how are they responding. And I really love the title of this particular webinar. Um, this is the, if I'm not mistaken, Eileen and Anthony who, who are in on this call, this is I think the third country-based uh, webinar we've had. We've, we've also um, uh, had alumni in Nepal and in Ethiopia. And this would be, Ghana would be the third country-based group that are getting together to discuss issues. Um, we've also held webinars based on uh, constituency groups like women. Uh, the very first one was on women's leadership in the pandemic. And we've held them on sort of thematic uh, conversations. So Yogesh, our colleague Yogesh Gore, I see somebody uh, here put down there, a graduate from the Livelihoods and Markets course at Natus. Um, Yogesh led a, and Farouk led a, a conversation um, around uh, inclusive economies in the pandemic. This is incredibly important, I think, just, just to reconnect with everybody, to have a chance to get together and, 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 and join with a network for solidarity. But it's also important in terms of how we can learn from how each other are, are faring, uh, some of the innovations that people are seeing around them to take some inspiration. And for us at Cody, I think it's really important for us to keep our, our boots muddy, as they say, even though it's virtually right now, um, as a way of adjusting our programming so that we're more relevant to the moment, um, so that when we are able to do courses again, uh, and we hope to be doing that soon, um, that we will be able to put them in the context of where people are. Um, coming out of this unprecedented time. So welcome everyone, I'm very excited. I do have to drop off after about 30 minutes uh, to go to another meeting, but I'm gonna try to listen and I'm glad that this is recorded because I will certainly read through uh, or play through the recording uh, after. So thank you everyone. And again, Bash, thank you for joining with Eileen to, to put this together. And, and Professor Atia, I know you're not here. I uh, wish you were, it'd be nice to see you. Uh, thank you again for all the work you've done. Great, thank you so much, Gord. And I'm now gonna turn over to, to Bash to set the stage for us for our conversation. Hi, everyone again. Elham, are you there? I'm here. Okay. So um, I'll just give a brief background about what happened in Ghana. So um, we all know that the novel coronavirus started in China in 2019 but we didn't um, have a feel of it until March 2020 when we recorded the first two cases. And during that time, um, around March 28th, our president um, gave a directive for us to go on a partial lockdown, not for the whole country, but some selected parts of the country for two weeks. And then after the two weeks period, he added a week more to it. But prior to that, there has been a ban on social gathering. Our schools were closed way before the partial lockdown started. And we've been recording series of issues because of that. So the partial lockdown were instituted in part of Accra, part of Kumase and Tema, and then Kaswa in the central region. But now the partial lockdown has been lifted and things are almost back to normal. I say that because um, markets are open, which are the places where most of us are scared of, because those places you cannot actually affect any of the preventive measures of the novel coronavirus, talking of social and physical distancing, 
talking about people even respecting the wearing of masks and gloves and protecting themselves, talking about people giving themselves spaces. These are very difficult things and all of us are scared. But then there are also issues related to decent work, uh, which is one of the very important pillars in the SDGs uh, because people are losing their jobs. We've had cases where most of the people who teach um, with private schools have already lost their jobs. Some are not getting salaries, some have pay cut. There are a lot of issues that we're facing around this time. And one of the issues that has been very important to most of us has been the gender gap that we all feel in all the interventions that Ghana has so far, that we also feel that the discussions around COVID and the president coming out to make um, speeches and talk to us about it doesn't reflect a gender uh, responsive statement because we still see a gap where women are not specifically taking care of, like schools are still closed as we speak, um, public places where we used to take our kids to are still closed, but we have to go to work and people are thinking about what to do with their kids. And these are also part of the times where people unfortunately have to choose between family and work, which is not fair to anyone, which also comes back to talking about no poverty, SDG one, talking about five on gender equality, because through this, a lot of people might exit the labor market, which we do not want. So that is where we are now. And we are very interested in having a broader conversation with our colleagues here in Ghana to find a way forward. Everyone to share with us. Uh, that is why we are having this conversation to help us identify some of the gaps that some of us have not seen. What needs to be done to close that gaps amongst ourselves and for the country, community engagement, how your organizations are responding to some of the issues that we are recording in your various areas because now we almost have more than 10 regions recording cases. We also want you to share your experiences. It could be your lockdown experiences. For some of us who lived in houses where, compound houses, where you have a lot of people living in the same houses, people have recorded issues of gender-based violence, where people have been beating their wives, children have been abused and other things. So you could share all these with us. And also in your um, interventions, you could also share the gender dynamics that you also notice that we have not seen. There have also been issues of food security that have been, discussions have been going on. And if you have cases of uh, the discrepancies between the informal sector and the former economies, what is going on there? Issues about, for instance, Greater Accra against Upper West Region. How is the dynamics like? Because Accra is the epicenter and the capital and is an urban area. If you go to a rural, rural area in Upper West Region, how is it like? How can we work around to make sure that everyone, uh, the intervention we give reaches everyone? How might we provide leadership as a group in this time? We could think about the way forward and how we could take some of the discussions forward and see how we can actually intervene. It could be through social media, it could be through the media, radio and television because they are still very actively working and helping us throughout the whole process. Elaine? Great, thank you so much, Bash. So Bash has set the stage about why we need to have this conversation today and a bit of the state of a general state of what's happening right now in Ghana. Um, and as we move forward through the conversation, um, one of the, you know, some of the areas that we, we would like to take a look at is first of all, you know, what are we doing in terms of supporting uh, responses to the pandemic? And here I'm in, interested in particularly. Um, you know, how we're ensuring that those responses are gender informed, how they, how gender analysis is being brought to the table, if it is, or if it's being overlooked um, in, in terms of addressing areas around um, those that Ash already mentioned, including food security, economic livelihoods, health and sanitation, public awareness and education. And each of you are in your respective organizations may be doing um, and maybe uh, looking at ways in which you're, re you're responding and navigating to that. Um, and then moving, be moving forward from there, um, you know, how are we engaging and responding to those that are particularly vulnerable, um, underrepresented, group, underrepresented groups, which of course includes women um, and children, but also thinking about those with disabilities, um, the aged, which is, a, you know, uh, obviously that's a, 
a, a, a portion of the population that's particularly um, at risk right now. Um, the economic mar economically marginalized and the socially uh, oppressed. Um, we, as we were discussing this webinar and, and what is really required, Bash alluded to this already, um, and this came up in our earlier conversations about how are we influencing major public policy decisions that are happening? If, first of all, where are we seeing the gaps that Bash uh, referred to earlier? And, and what is it that we can collectively be doing to, to influence those decisions um, as, as things are moving forward and we're coming also um, out of this pandemic um, and into a new, what we call a new normal, if you will. And then finally, and then, you know, building on that, really, what is the, what are the ways that we can collectively act? Um, whether we're uh, Cody graduates or we're just with our respective organizations in Ghana, what is it that we can do to come together to be even more um, effective in, in those, uh, in those responses mm -hmm. and in that, in those interventions? And, you know, like, uh, I'm sure like everybody, like even uh, Cody, for example, um, our organizations are all very vulnerable right now. With the lockdown, we, uh, our, 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 uh, our mode of business has completely changed. In the case of Cody, for example, all of you have had experiences of coming to Cody courses, perhaps on campus or perhaps um, together in other places uh, around the world. Um, and we've actually had to change our business model entirely, given the fact that we can't travel, that we're all at home working. Um, and so clearly this is a, this is a major shift for, um, for uh, community-based organizations in the way that they operate and, and how they get sustained, um, and even how they uh, ensure that they are able to continue those, those vital programs that they have. So, what is it that we can start to think about as we look at our own sustainability as organizations so that we can continue to do our good work? So I'll leave it there, And but now it's a moment for us to start to open up the conversation. And maybe what I will ask is that Bash and Elham, who um, started the conversation with me, um, kick off this conversation by sharing a little bit about the work that they've been doing and where they see uh, some potential for for uh, collective action or moving forward to address gaps. Bash and Elham, do you want to start that off? And then what we will do is open it up to, to uh, the participants on our call um, to sure. get their insights. Yeah, sure. Elham? Yes. Yeah, please go on. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, um, I think I've, uh, we have all experienced what has happened in Ghana. And then for me, my experience has been working around gender budgets and gender planning. And then one of the things I have observed and we have worked on is the issue of uh, uh, government shifting budgets. Where are these budgets being shifted to? And then also governments uh, um, working on uh, some uh, level of relief to citizens. Are this uh, relief getting to the right people? We've all seen on television how things are distributed and then in the end, marginalized group, groups are, are left out. So what we currently are doing is to do budget analysis of the ministry's budget, the Ministry of Gender in particular, the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection, how much of their money is being cut, how much of their money is being increased with other MMDAs, how are they making sure, even though most of them were not under lockdown, how are they making sure that vulnerable groups, marginalized groups, are not further marginalized in the, in the face of all this. So what we've been doing is to work with 60 partner MMDAs, that's the uh, uh, Metropolitan Municipal and District Assembly. One, to look at the agenda gap, to do gender analysis on their work. Two, is to also to re-plan, to re-look at how their work plan are being shaped to take care of the needs of both men and women, and in particular with marginalized groups. And then third is to engage with the national actors, the national actors like Minister of uh, Finance, Minister of Gender, and then all the other relevant ministries that we feel that uh, they work with marginalized groups and their work would have, would either have a positive or a negative impact on marginalized groups. 
So basically, I, I, I also think that in all of this, there's also positive. There are a lot of positives in, in, in it. So we don't just talk about only the challenges that we go through. We also look out for, for the positives. Most of us have stayed home for, for a long time, only this period. We also have um, a lot of our work. I mean, the gaps in our work are being also exposed. We do a lot of work. We do a lot of running around. But I don't think we ever sit down to go through. We do monitoring fine. We, but to sit back and observe how far our impact have gone, we haven't really done that. And then also to see how sustainable that our work have been able to sustain at the community level. For example, in most of the communities that we worked in the Upper West region, I mean, with this, most of these women have rallied together and they have come together and then have come form a support, kind of a support, a safety net for them to support each other. So these are things that we hardly talk about, but these are things that um, are coming up strongly. So the way forward, what do we do with all the issues coming up, both the challenges, both the successes, and both the resilience that are coming out from all these communities. Women demanding space and women taking up space and women also taking up leadership, uh, leadership in their communities to ensure that things doesn't get out of hand. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elham. So I'll briefly share a bit about trade unions. Um, in Ghana, unfortunately, the trade unions have not been able to organize in um, I would say majority of workers are still unorganized, but thankfully we organize um, in both in the formal economies and the informal economies. And with the informal economies, because we are still in the process of formalizing it, things are a bit more different for them than the formal sector. Talking about issues of, for instance, we have um, our Labor Act, which is fully protecting formal economy workers, but doing little for the informal sectors. And one of the issues that we've been having out of this for the formal sectors especially is how some uh, transnational corporations for the big companies have to rethink their strategies. You know, most of them will contract loans to do their activities. And because of the lockdown and some other issues, they were having issues with exports or even imports for some materials that they use. So some of them, were in discussions with some of the trade unions of their workplaces to one, not to lay off workers, but to let workers go and leave. But the difficulty has been, some said they couldn't sustain paying all the workers whilst on leave. So they had some skeletal workers still on site. But then the challenge for trade unions were, how do we ensure that these workers do not go home? One, empty-handed, that they, are, they still have some form of income security for themselves and their families. So that has been one of the major challenges we've had. And the other challenge, especially to deal with women, had to do with issues of child care, which we've been campaigning for for some number of years now. Even though it is guaranteed in our 1992 constitution in Article 27, even government have failed on that duty to provide childcare. So schools are still on lockdown. And prior to that, you know, schools went on lockdown before, schools were closed before the lockdown was instituted. So most of the women were forced to take their annual leave, to go home to take care of the kids. And now the partial lockdown came and organizations still forced some of the workers to take their leave to go home. Now the lockdown is no more. Everyone has to return to work. Women do not have leave this anymore. Their kids are at home. And there is a dilemma between looking at what do I do, especially pertaining to taking care of my children. And we've also had cases of most of our private schools laying off their workers. Immediately, the lockdown was instituted. Some of them sent their workers home without any form of um, income. They just asked them to go home until everything was over. And most of these teachers are women, especially with the crutches and the basic schools. Most of them are women. So there's also an issue coming out of that. One of the things we've been trying to do is to continue the talk about parental leave. We don't have that in Ghana. So if I exhaust my leave this, I could always fall on that. 
And because also majority of the workers are still unorganized, it's between them and their employers. Because for those who have trade unions, it is easy for the unions to go and intervene. But if you do not have a trade union, the employer just hands you a decision that they've taken without your input. And that is very serious for them. And one of the issues that we are also scared of is the fact that we know that after this pandemic, there's going to be a lot of recorded cases of job losses. And in this sense, a lot of employers who already were having some difficulty employing women, because we were recording cases of people not employing women, women going for interview and being asked questions about how many cases do you have? How many cases do you plan to have? When do you plan getting married? And all sort of things, just because nobody wants to be responsible for women's maternity issues. So definitely after this pandemic, we know for sure that if we are going to be recording a lot of redundancies and layoffs, most of the affected people are going to be women. So we have to start thinking about creative ways of dealing with that particular issues. And we've been running campaigns to make sure that the stimulus packages that our government is announced to give to organizations has a condition attached to it that you cannot access that package and still send workers home because government is helping you with that package to sustain the business. So how do you send workers home? So those are some of the issues that we've had to deal with. And also we've recorded cases of workplace violence, especially for health workers, where they go to work and patients, you know, because of psychological and emotional reasons, sometimes attack these health workers or even say words that are very abusive to their person. So that's what I'll say for now. I don't know if them, there are, uh, I see Patricia from Netrite online. I don't know if she's still there. I see Wendy and I see other people from, I see Fati, I see Dockers from my organization too. So if anyone has any more thing to add, please do so. And I also quickly, um, Elaine, some of the challenges, I am from the agri sector. So some of the challenges that we recorded with the informal sector, uh, especially with the farmers, was that at the time of the lockdown, you know, our government had to send the security forces out on the street to make sure that people were complying. And some of the security agencies were stopping farmers from even going to their farm or even sending their product to the market. And also even, you know, some of them are in the rural communities and then they will send the product to some of these vehicle stations to go and give to the vehicles, maybe to be transported to Accra to be sold. So they were having challenges and people were recording losses where, I mean, perishable goods, things were going bad for them. And people had also contracted loans as farmers to take care of their farm. And people are recording losses now which is also a dilemma for most of them, how to repay the loans, even though government is working with financial institutions. You know, this thing cannot stay on for a very long time. And women farmers also, women, market women also are recording issues because most of the markets were closed during the lockdown period because it was difficult to comply with the um, preventive directive that were given. So markets were closed, they had to stay at home. And you know, people were selling perishable goods again in the market and they were also going bad. So there are different dynamics to the discussion. I'm sure that once, by the time we hear from everyone on board, we will be able to have a fair idea about the different sectors and how destructive this has been. Yeah, thank you so much, Bash. Um, between you and Elham, you unpacked quite a lot, actually, and we could go in many different directions with that conversation. But essentially, again, um, focusing here on on you know uh, on, on what what it really takes to ensure that that um, all workers, informal and formal, have the protections and the supports that they're going to need in terms of being able to move forward. And you know the the uh, the careful analysis you did just on one instance of say for example teachers of schools that were being we uh, being dismissed or laid off without pay and being told to wait um, and the implications of that. You can see the ripple effect it has just on the education sector. The same with the agricultural sector where farmers 
might have been stopped in terms of their ability to transport um, their their product um, or even just to get to their farms. So the the tremendous loss. How do you quantify the loss? But then again, what kinds of opportunities are there um, in the midst of that to make sure that we're building um, strategies for uh, and coping mechanisms to move forward? So very again, very important to see the uh, the the need for uh, a strong intersectional analysis, if you will, um, to see what uh, the, the different ways that people are uh, are affected. So I'm turning now to, to the rest of you that have joined this call um, and asking um, who would like to start off the conversation. Um, if you wanna either, uh, maybe what I can do is, uh, if I don't see people raising hands, I'm gonna start to pick on you and ask you to give us a short, um, just a short um, intervention and, and so that we can hear as, from as many people as possible and also we can come back to you as well. So I'm just taking a look through here um, and seeing who's got their, uh, who's online here. I see Tr Trisha. Patricia, did you want to start off? I see you. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. The, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Ellen, thank you. And I believe uh, Elham and, and Bashira too have already shared some of the th our experiences here in Ghana. So what I, I want to add, and unfortunately I joined a bit late, so I'm not really sure what uh, they shared, uh, especially Baj, what uh, she, she started with. But there are issues now around, in, in the wake of uh, COVID-19, there are issues around uh, child care facilities, there are issues around um, there are issues around the way our whole uh, market, uh, market systems are structured so, uh, so to, enable, to ensure social distancing and so on because our markets lack basic infrastructure. There are issues around uh, flexible and uh, working hours. And, and uh, I heard uh, the last bit of uh, Bart's uh, interventions on uh, the effect on agriculture workers, the effect on market women and all that. So, I don't have to repeat that. What we've done, I work for a uh, network for women's rights. And uh, what we've done uh, is to, uh, it, during the stages, the initial stages, we, issue, we led women groups to issue statements and uh, calling on the government to ensure that um, the government's response are gender responsive. But we noticed that even with the sharing, the social protection and uh, interventions that are being put in place so uh, vulnerable women uh, 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 are not being taken uh, are not being cared for uh, in terms of the way even items are shared and all those things, there are issues and uh, around it what we want to do now as a network is to and uh, we've already asked our members to share uh, their uh, their experiences on impact of covid but what we want to do is to do a gender impact analysis of government and uh, directives and the uh, policies that they've issued uh, uh, during this period. There's even a law that has been passed to give the president uh, 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 extra powers uh, to do some of the things that uh, he's doing. But there are also uh, uh, issues around that because uh, some have debated that there are already laws that can give him the kind of powers that uh, he, he needs and that the law would lead to abuse of, of power. So what we want to do as NetRite as a way forward is to do a, a gender, first have a meeting with our membership to find out how uh, uh, this, uh, the, their COVID experience and then do a gender impact analysis of uh, government policies and directives that have been issued and, uh, and, uh, and during this period and see how best we can use the findings uh, to inform advocacy around and uh, gender uh, responsive actions uh, during uh, this period. Yeah, thank you so much. It's really interesting to see Hello. the work that NetRight is, uh, is planning on doing. And um, we, you know, we were, were thinking a little bit too about um, not just how they've responded to date, but how they move forward in in terms of the next um, the next several months and the ways in which the uh, you know the gender uh, 
it's you know ways in which decisions are made that are gender informed and who's got the ear if you if you will of those senior officials to make sure that that happens um when we talked um, a little bit yesterday uh with uh professor atia and bash and elham we also talked about the need for looking at gender responsive budgeting as part of the reconfiguration of municipal and national governments uh, budgeting um, moving forward, considering how much might shift um, and the re-emphasis around healthcare, for, for example. So that might be something also to take into consideration, Patricia, as you're, as you're looking at that, um, that information as well. Um, I'm just going to ask. Uh, yes, yeah, maybe yeah. to add, Elham. Yeah, it's it's uh, when we do the when we do the gender impact analysis um, and the kind of narratives and policies that uh, have been put in place uh, during and uh, this period, we are going to look at its impact in terms of uh, 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 from economic, social. And, and political perspective. Political. So, okay. Yeah, so we're going to look at issues around, um, for instance, uh, uh, livelihoods, issues around livelihoods, uh, issues around how, uh, issues around how, how uh, livelihoods, issues around health uh, implications. So, so it's it, it's a collective thing. Whilst look, we are looking at the poly, uh, directives and policies and relating them to social economic and political issues to see how it has impacted women and then use that to inform actions that we will take. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to now ask um, uh, somebody else to uh, speak. Um, I'm just looking here at the, at the camera. Pati, Pati, would you like to yeah. go ahead? And then I'll turn to Zobazi. Is that, is that you, Zobazi, at the top there? You're in the dark a little bit, but start, I'll start with Fati. Fati? Yes, please. Uh, good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm very happy to be part of the discussion group. Well, uh, uh, Bash have spoken a lot. I uh, was I was uh, there before everything, all the conversations started. So I listened to the uh, three speakers, and then uh, they've dilated much on uh, the lockdown and then uh, some of uh, the few issues that I wanted to add. But I want to say that uh, coming from, uh, speaking from Tamale, Northern region, we also have about 10 cases in Northern region. And then only uh, yesterday, we realized that one of them also tested negative again. It was a market woman that was lifted. And this woman now is going to face stigmatization in the market because she was in the market when they went and lifted her and it's going to affect her business seriously. Because uh, the, the test sometimes, you can't tell whether the, uh, what do you call it, uh, the instrument used for the testing, whether it's on or off or what. Sometimes they will send somebody to go and take the person, say that the person is negative, and then in a week's time, without even any drug, they will come with another result that the person Hey, the person is uh, was positive, then they reach and they will come with a negative report. By then, the person has already been exposed, especially the women, they've already been exposed to their colleagues that that woman was uh, tested positive. And the stigmatization is now the problem to me. This woman coming into the community there now, people will, uh, will shine away from her, uh, she, her business is going to go down. Nobody will go to her to buy anything again. And then uh, in our own small way, coming from a from foundation, an NGO that I've set up is a, a gender uh, women, women activist uh, area. We work in the area of gender, women empowerment and livelihood. And I, we sent, we are uh, distributing a uh, news map and then hand sanitizers to the women in these communities. We have already done two districts, Solon district and then Kumbogo district. We have, if you go to our Facebook page, you see some of the pictures there that speak to itself. And then uh, we also, we also sensitize them on the washing of hands, washing of hands using the Victoria bucket that they have recommended in Ghana here. And then uh, we also sensitize them on the uh, 
uh, social distancing. The system, if you look at it, you see the system spacing is all being done. And then uh, when you come back to talking about women in the former sector, and then uh, our participation, when Madam uh, Sister uh, Bashira spoke, women, we really need to be spoken to. We ourselves as women, we also have our own challenges. You realize that most of these are women when they marry, their output in the office itself is low. Some of them, when they are pregnant, they don't even want to come to office. I've experienced it myself. Yes, I've experienced it myself. I'm working with women. I think that my organization is a women organization. And for that matter, I need to have more women more than men in my office. We ourselves, I have spoken to the young ladies that I've worked, I've working with parents. When they are pregnant, the girl that the other first lady, her, her output was far, far above the, all the young guys that I had in the office. But since she got married and had one child, it has changed her. It, even she doesn't even come to office. She comes us and when she wants. And now she's pregnant. And now she's pregnant again. So we, the women, we have to be talking to our colleague women to step up. You understand? We, uh, the, when we say that uh, sometimes this, uh, our attitude, like the, the working force, uh, it will affect the women. But we, the women, so have to be talking to. Sometimes when they see that your output is low, they always prefer that you leave the office. And then they will bring somebody who can produce better. <laughs> so we ourselves, we the women ourselves, we have to be talked to. I, at least when we hold meetings, we should try to encourage each other to not let marriage and childbirth affect our output. It's no good. That thing is no good. We should set up. Yes, please. Uh, sorry, just, just briefly, okay. if I may come in. Yes. You know, um, pregnancy-related issues is not something that all of us go through the same way. You know, yes. pregnancy affects women differently. Me, for, for one, when I'm pregnant, I go to the office till I deliver. I have another mm -hmm. colleague who cannot even come to the office. She has to be home. So, you know, Patricia mentioned flexible work hours, which is one of the issues we have to start looking at if we are employers. Uh, if this person's output yes. was so good, yes. then means it is not a fault that her output is very low. So what can yes. we do to support somebody whose output is going down because of pregnancy? And remember, our labor act specifically mm -hmm. says that when a woman is mm -hmm. pregnant, there is uh, you have to audit the work that the person do to make sure that the work is yeah. safe and the person can still carry on with that work. If the person cannot carry on with the work, the labor acts we should the labor act says mm -hmm. we should change the task of the person to a lighter one so that the person yes. will still be in employment until after lactating, so that the person can go back yeah. to their normal duties in the office. And remember, there is a very strong protection that when a woman is pregnant and lactating you cannot get that person listed on redundancy or layoff or yes. even dismiss the person. That would be unfair termination of employment. Maybe we will have to discuss some of these issues yeah. more later. So yeah. I'm going to just jump in. Thank you very much, Fatih. Fatih, one of the comments that you made was, I think, really important at the beginning, which is around the stigmatization of people yes. who have yes. exactly. COVID-19. I'm, we'll I'm going to move on now because I see there's other people um, with hands raised. And I did also yes. ask. Uh, guys, I haven't so... finished. Uh, I haven't finished. Let me just let me conclude, please. Okay, okay. sure. I, yeah, I haven't finished. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sabashira, for throwing more. But well, uh, I, you know, I'm also a, a labor person, and I know all these things. These are all things, things that I know. But I'm saying that we, among we ourselves, we should be talking to each other. It doesn't so take it from us not to like the fact that uh, we shouldn't be talking. We should be talking to, to each other that when we marry. Not just getting pregnant, even the marriage itself affects some of us. You understand? When we marry, we shouldn't affect uh, some of us. And then, uh, talking about uh, the uh, trade union, uh, I realize that African World, African World Airlines, is a domestic airline in Ghana. Most of their workers were being laid, uh, laid off because of this COVID 19. And then, some of the, uh, they have so many ladies there, and they were complaining a lot. Now they have 
they have resumed work just last week and they have not called about 90% of the ladies have not been called back. They are calling them one after the other. And some of them are not sure whether they will be called or not. This particular group I'm telling you about, Sister Bashira, they are not unionized. So you have to take note of them. You have to take note of uh, African well, this airline, the domestic airlines, but they are not being unionized. So if all these people should become unionized members, at least they will have a voice that can talk on their behalf. So let's think about that area too. Okay. And then uh, most of the and then most of the private schools too, their teachers are complaining. They are complaining that they might not be get they might not uh, get paid. The private schools, most of their teachers, they will not get paid. And most of the teachers too, they have uh, this youth, the youth, young uh, ladies and then young uh, women, uh, uh, men, male and females, both are there. So they are not, they are also complaining bitterly that uh, they are not getting paid. Even this last month that ended, most of them were not paid. Meanwhile, some of them are trying, they are doing a line edition, online series with uh, the children at home. So yeah. in my own small way, okay. uh, as I told you earlier, I'm doing, I'm uh, doing my own small way. It's not government. Government has not even given me anything. But I'm using my own money to show uh, max, this nose max and then uh, I bought lenses and hand sanitizers. I did uh, fundraising. I did fundraising in my own way. At least I got some people that contributed. And I'm distributing to the women, the women and the uh, adolescents and the youth in the community. Solon District of Kumbogo District. I'm distributing to them and uh, we have already sensitized them on the usage of the uh, hand washing and then also the usage of the, even the sanitizers and then how to also uh, what do you call it, practice uh, social distancing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fatih. I'm going to turn over now to uh, Zabazi and then to Osman, who has his hand raised, and then to Alham. Zabazi, do you want to go ahead? Would you like to go ahead, Zabazi? I'm not sure if I said your name uh, yes, right. Please. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, I'm a Ghanaian, please. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, go ahead. Hello, okay. I'm actually in Dyson Officer in London Hospital. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hi, we can hear you. Hello? Yes, okay. we can okay. hear you. I'm actually in Dyson Officer in London Hospital. In the okay. 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 in London here. Actually, the man came up as a trader and came back having the signs and symptoms. We tested and he's positive. So, when you look at the anxiety and the panic around the nurses and the community members, it wasn't easy. So, I'm just going to tailor to my work as nursing and what I do in the community. In the communities, most people are not actually aware of how the virus can be transmitted. Talking about the airborne. Uh, contact means like uh, uh, through. I mean, um, hello. Yeah, Hi. I'm. I'm sorry, so Bazi, you're 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 cutting out quite a lot in terms of your speaking. I'm just wondering if you would mind typing some of what you were just saying in the chat box so that we don't miss anything that you you were trying to say. What I got from you was. Um, and, you know, certainly um, speaking to the healthcare sector and the anxiety around around what is happening and some of the lack of awareness yes. around virus transmission. Would you be able to share a little bit more? Uh, try try again, and then maybe share a little bit in the chat box as well. Yes. Then in the community, the impact on the business is something at least that is very pervasive. Most of the women, I happen to live around the border area, very far, close to uh, Burkina Faso. When most of the women, they go there to buy goods, come to Ghana and sell. And now that there's lockdown, uh, most of the women cannot go by uh, this, their trading. Uh, there happened to be a man who crossed with Burkina and never came back. After mm. now, we still don't know the whereabouts of the man. Most women who are uh, meet on the way, crossing the border or coming back, in fact, 
the, the treatment they give to them is nothing. It's something very worrying. In the markets where mm. they tried at least, every, most of the people here, they are not government employee or in any commercial sector. Uh, their means of earning, uh, I mean, their means of living is just on the trade and the petty trading. So uh, it's, it's something that is actually affecting the people all over. Then uh, come to the health sector. We are talking about uh, the protective equipment. And we happen to be in a rural area where, in fact, we are not, we are not already, we are having the challenges with the resources and uh, compounded by this issue, we are actually struggling. I can't say everything online here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Those are actually very uh, important points that you raised around what's happening at the border level with respect to trade and the impact of particularly on women traders um, that is happening there, uh, as well as in, you know, your interventions around the, uh, the, uh, the healthcare sector and the protective equipment, which is what we're seeing, you know, worldwide right now in terms of lack of protective uh, equipment uh, available. Um, thank you so much. Could you add a little bit more in the chat box as well if you have some more to say? Um, and I would like to turn to Osman, who has his hand raised. Osman, would you please go ahead? Yeah. Osman, uh, good yeah, morning. Go ahead. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. My name is Osman. Uh, I am a senior assistant registrar at the Camaret Technical University. And also, I'm the co-founder for Dagbam Center for Leadership and Development in Tamale, Northern Region, Ghana. Uh, for us, we are concentrating on two issues. One, uh, public organizations uh, adhering to the social, I mean, the protocols regarding the COVID-19. And also, we are dealing with uh, communities outside Tamale, we call them Tamale Rural. Uh, the first one, regarding the first one, what we are engaging is that we try to visit public institutions to find out whether they are adhering to the strict protocols, uh, 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 whether they are adhering to the strict protocols of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, the observation is that uh, if you visit most public organizations in and around Tamale, you will realize that most organizations do not pay more attention to their protocols. Uh, for confidentiality, uh, it will not be ideal for me to I mean, mention these names. But these are very serious organizations that are bridging the protocols. And we are compiling these organizations, and at the appropriate time, we intend to come out with a press briefing so that government and key stakeholders will know that these institutions, these institutions are not in any way helping in preventing this particular uh, pandemic. Another thing that we are also doing is that it appears the concentration is within the urban communities. So we are working with the communities outside the metropolis. So our concentration is Tamale rural. And it is amazing and revealing that if you visit these communities, one, their knowledge regarding this pandemic is very limited and how we adhere to the protocols. So we are thinking that in the next few days or weeks, we will come up with this communities that are not being dealt with within the Kamali uh, uh, rural communities. So basically, this is what we are doing. Public organizations adhering to the protocols and Tamil rural communities. So for now, that is what we are doing as a center. Thank you. Thank you so much, Osborne. Thank you very much. Um, Elham, if you don't mind, I'm just going to go to Wendy first and then come back to you. Is that all right with you? Uh, Wendy, you have your you have your when you have your hand up. Wendy, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Go ahead. Um, my my name is Wendy. As you know, I'm a nurse. I'm a graduate of Kuduch. I work in a very small village, a very small community. So practically all the women here are petty traders. They farm. They send their produce to the market in our district's capital, sell it, and make money off it. 
But when the lockdown was initiated, we weren't really a part of it, but market days were put off where women can't take their produce. For example, in my area, market days are on Sundays where they take everything that they've made within the week, sell them off and get the things that they needed to help them take care of their children. So market days were closed and it became very difficult for them. We went in and supported them. Of course, on the next, we have a small organization where we went in and supported them. I wanted to talk about the stigmatization aspect. So in my district, in the area that I'm in specifically, I take care of COVID, like every information that has to do with COVID in the district, like my awesome district, where I work. I'm, I'm at work, I'm not wearing my mask and stuff because of the meeting. So what happened was a man, someone tested positive, we had a positive case in our area, and then his brother, apparently who was with him, we had to quarantine him. What happened was everybody, because it's a small community, Everybody knew this man and they were avoiding the wife, the children, the man. They were pointing fingers at them. It got to a time the man almost took his own life. We got a call from them and then we had to rush in and talk to him, cancel him on everything because we had already taken the sample to test him. We had to quarantine himself, quarantine him. I had to check on him every day, every other day to make sure that he was okay. So eventually last, last Friday the test came and he tested negative. Fortunately for us, our patients have also recovered and he's also tested negative. But COVID has really affected this women here because still the market days are closed. The day-to-day -day market is, is open. But this is a small community where almost everybody has a farm. So what you're selling, almost everybody has something in their homes. So you have to take it to the district, district capital to sell them off. But the market days are closed. So these goods are perishing. And these women are finding it very, very difficult to support their children. So what we do is we go in and we support them in our own small way. My organization, my partner with DNS, we have a small organization. We go in and then we support them. So that's been the, the main impact of COVID in my area has been on our grip. And then we have also been on women, their day-to-day -day activities, their income, their employment, integrity of their children. And also the fact that in a small community where all the children are not going to school, now they, most of them are being forced to go to the farm, to do all those things. They are not having time. And then one of us is the children in the city have been seeing my case in three weeks. I have to work in this village and it's tough for me. So those children in the <clears throat> cities have access to online classes, online schools. Unlike the children in my community, they don't have access to anything. So if school is pulled into September, they have to wait till September before they, they will start to learn again. So it's really tough. It's difficult to get them together. Now, every other day, some child is hurt. We have to come, we have to see each other, you have to do that. They are always playing outside. The mothers need some of them in care of even younger ones to take care of their own siblings and it's so far. So that's been the impact of COVID in my area and then my workplace. Thank you. Mm. Helene, your microphone is off. Ah. Thank you very much, Bash, and thank you, Wendy, for your comments and uh, and for your great work as a as an essential worker at this time. Um, and I uh, want to um, want to give you a, a sense of our solidarity with you as you do this work. Yes, clap, clap, clap. Um, good points also raised around the impact on on families and on children in terms of the the education and what we. We've been um, exploring a little bit also in other country contexts what what the COVID-19 crisis means for in for children, particularly in rural areas that don't have the access um, that others might have to online resources. And even where those online resources are available, really what that means in terms of the the child's ability to focus and and to and to really move their education forward. Um, so thank you for those. I'm going to now turn to Elham, and then I see um, that Abdul Wahid had his hand up and Trisha has her hand up. Um, so I'll go over to them. And I want you to also be making, uh, thinking about also our collective action as, we, as we're going through these conversations. Where, what are the, where are the opportunities we have for collective mobilizing or action or connection um, at this time? So Elham and then Abdul Wahid and then Trisha. Alham, go ahead. Okay, so um, I just wanted to respond to Fatih's uh, issue of women getting married and not working very well, and then also linking it up to the current 
relevant uh, situation we all find ourselves. So if you look around us here in Ghana and in our communities, uh, most of the first people that were asked to go home were women with young children, you know, because uh, these sentiments that Fati raised are the same issues that are being raised across board. But as women leaders, as people working on an advancing gender equality, how do we take space and then ensure that this doesn't happen? Because- Elham, you're cutting out and uh, it might be that you need to turn your camera uh, off. For young women, it's people are getting married around the same time their career is advancing around the same time that they are having children and then you cannot put any of them on hold and wait till one is done before you move on to the other okay so i i mentioned is it okay yes Hello. Yes, Ilan. So what I said was, I, I just wanted to touch briefly on Fatih's uh, submission that uh, we have young women who get married and are not able to perform as they were when they were single. And then it's, it's a national war and I've had an opportunity to sit at a very high level. Hello. Hi, Ilan. We can hear you. Hello. OK. We can hear you. Elham, Fatih, come on now. Yeah, Elham, if you don't mind, I'm going to come back to you in a minute because you've been breaking out. Um, and yeah. I wondered if you could add your comment in the chat box for a moment, and then I'll come back to you yeah. if that's okay. Um, I'm going to turn to Abdul Wahid for a moment. Abdul, what um, you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Um, Eileen, just briefly, Abdul. Hello. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, I am seeing a lot of um, differences between the experiences that Fatih, Wendy, Osman, and the others shared. So in your submission, could you please throw more light on what some of the um, differences and challenges you see? between the interventions for urban areas like Accra, Kumasi, and then the other rural communities that you've been reporting on. It will be very helpful for us to note all of these um, gaps as well. Thank you. Great, and Abdul, please go ahead. Okay. Um... I'm supposed to be speaking from Ghana, but I'm currently in uh, Canada here in St. John's. Uh, I've been here since September 2019, so um, I'll be speaking from, uh, uh, I've been having contact with my organization all along, so even though I don't have first-hand experience, I just want to share um, what my organization is currently uh, doing with regards to the COVID issue. Um, I work uh, with the municipal assembly, Kintampo uh, South, within the middle belt. So, um, since the, this thing started, what um, I think government has instituted a lot of uh, protocols that uh, uh, they have asked Ghanaians to, to follow. But uh, with regards to the municipal assemblies, they have so far sent some money to the municipalities to intensify uh, education and other uh, activities regarding uh, COVID. And so far we've received uh, two funds uh, with regards to that. And uh, the focus is just on the markets that we should put infrastructure in terms of uh, sanitation, improving the sanitation at the markets, and then uh, providing water, uh, veronica buckets and other stuff. Um, so far, in my personal experience, uh, what I'm, I don't know whether civil societies are aware of these funds being sent to the municipality because one thing about um, 
activities that are happening within the municipalities or in Ghana is the issue of monitoring. There are things happening, but then who follows up to see what is actually happening there? And it's, it's, it's an issue that uh, I think the civil society organization should take up. And um, uh, adding to that, um, what I've also realized is that um, because the civil society are not active regarding these things, uh, politicians take advantage and then they uh, bring out issues and then it muddies the whole issue. It's a, it's a national issue and because civil society are not up and talking about what should be done, uh, opposition parties come out with issues and then they, uh, uh, what is expected to be done ha uh, has been turned to political uh, uh, issues. So uh, it's a call that I'm calling on the civil society organizations to take uh, initiative to follow up on what actually the municipalities are doing regard to uh, these issues. And I think uh, a few issues were mentioned that I, I would also want to uh, talk on is the issue of a behavioral change who regards the COVID issue. Uh, many, in many of the communities, they still don't appreciate the, the effect of the COVID-19 uh, virus. Um, I think the education is not gone down well. Um, we still have uh, people thinking that is yes, a normal, uh, they don't even believe it. And they believe that uh, when you prepare some concoctions, you'll be able to uh, 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 kill the virus or whatever. So the issue of behavioral change is very, very important that we should uh, be looking at. And uh, uh, to add to the issue of uh, the PPEs, um, this is also another major challenge that I'm foreseeing. I have, uh, my wife is also working uh, with uh, the clinic, one of the hospitals, and the mm -hmm. challenge that they are facing most is even the personal protective uh, uh, equipment. And at the point in time, I nearly said she shouldn't go to work again because you can't go to work and you are exposed <laughs> to uh, these things and then you have kids at home and when you come home, the first people that will meet you is your kids and it's, it's an issue. So it's actually a major issue that uh, we should be looking at as, as well. So I think those are the um, things. And again, maybe just to add, because ours is a public uh, institution, in terms of um, our organization, what we have done is that they have uh, prepared a roster like not all workers come to work at a the time. They, they go in shifts. So maybe if a particular group of people comes uh, in this particular week, then they go home and rest and the other group also comes so that we, uh, they observe the proper distancing and other protocols. And because the public institution, they are paid. So uh, I don't know regards to the private uh, organization, how they can be able to maybe adhere to some of these uh, protocols. Thank you very much, um, Abdul Wahid. I'm just conscious of the time and I know um, some people are um, uh, needing to sign off soon. We have about 15 minutes left and I have uh, about four people's hands up and I want to make sure that Elham and Bash um, get a final word here. Um, so I'm going to ask if you could um, uh, keep your interventions fairly short and I'm going to start with Gloria because we haven't heard from her yet. So Gloria, would you uh, please go ahead? Okay, so I actually want to ask for Bash's opinion on these two issues. Then I'll just share briefly on what my organization has been doing. I'm asking you specifically because you said you work with the labor union and then more into a Greek. I'm asking what do you think we can do to support women's livelihoods, especially food security issues in these times, following that um, there are issues of re-emergence of the army form well in some parts of Ghana, and uh, most of uh, women would be 
seriously affected, especially for us in the northern part of, of the country. And then um, with respect to village savings and loans groups to, well, we have been working with some groups and then uh, most of them had to share out within the last month because they needed money. And some actually wanted to invest these months into their farming activities. Now, I am actually very worried in the sense that um, economic activities due to the COVID is going to be seriously affected. They won't be able to earn so much income to save. And now these women are also thinking of diversifying the small monies they have in these times into agri. Now we are also hearing information about the reinsurgents of the fourth army worm. Yeah. I am a difficult time as to what kind of advice we should be given to these women groups <laughs> because we are actually in a balance right now. You don't know where they can invest the small incomes that they have at this particular point in time. But one issue that I think that we need to work more on is the fact that most of our women in the markets are still not observing the protocols. And I fear that they, would, they, are, they are at risk because I go to the market once in a while and when you talk to them, they are like, oh, it's, it hasn't reached here yet. If it reaches here, we would, we, would, we would observe. How can we go about it? You are in a labor union expert and maybe you're working with some groups. How can we ensure that at least women in the market spaces are adhering to these protocols so that at least we are able to protect them and also protect families because if a mother should contract a virus right now, it's a whole family. Yeah, that is true. Um, just briefly, um, what else? Say, uh, my husband also works in the informal sector, so he's also in the. But the reality is, what is happening now is that. Even in the, can I go on, Elaine? Yes, please go on. I'm, I'm listening. Okay. So even in the market, they, they are doing rationing. So they distributed some cards to the market, um, the people in the market who sell, the people who are in the market, and the cards have different colors. I think they have gold, red, green, etc. And what the cards are meant to do, Ndicha is going up. People will have to come to the market twice in a week. So if this shop comes today, it means the next shop is not coming. The other one is also not coming. So that is how they have decided to enforce social distancing. That is by the Metropolitan Assembly. Now, the other issue you raise about the livelihood. As a labor union, uh, we know that our former sector workers who have permanent jobs have job and income security. So for somebody like me, if I have to stay home for five months, I know that I'm guaranteed an income at the end of the month, but not everyone has that opportunity. So for the informal sectors, what we've been doing with the farmers especially is introducing them to what we call non-farm economic activity. We can talk about this more after this Zoom call so that I can share more insights with you. So this is just uh, briefly, we help them get alternative livelihoods. So when the farming produces are not good enough, they can still fall on the alternative livelihood to still make a living. So after the com co uh, um, Zoom conversation, I can share more with you about how we go about that. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you also to, um, uh, to Gloria for those comments. I think we did get a little cut off at the end, but I'm going to turn now to um, there's two different Trishas, but this is Fafa Patricia that's on our, I'm going to ask you if you could, uh, if you could quickly uh, speak um, uh, as well. Um, go ahead. Is it not right, Patricia? No, no. No, Fafa. You're next oh, after. You're next. Right, oh, so. Okay, okay. Fafa. Fafa, Fafa Patricia, please go ahead. If you can, I'm trying to unmute you, but it's not working. Okay, maybe Trisha, you go ahead it, now. Oh, sorry. Is it okay? 
Yes, now I can yes. see it. Go ahead. Yes. Bash, you have taken the cream from my mouth, but oh, what sorry. I would like to what I would <laughs> like to add to our discussion is as a human women's rights organization in Ghana, we need to come together and advocate for a policy change in the social protection of the vulnerable in the country. Because as such now, there is no way, there is any document that has identified the vulnerables whereby we can target them in crisis. This could be done from the district to the metropolitan level to the national level so that we can, we will know, we will have a disaggregated data of this scam or this group of people in, and in such situation, we can reach them directly. We have all seen how chaotic the interventions at the beginning when there was a total lockdown in the four cities of the country. It was messy. And the vulnerables that those things, uh, those interventions you reach were never reached. People who are touched by their situation have to come out with uh, other interventions to, bring, uh, to bridge them halfway. So we need to come together after the situation has come down and then advocate for a gender desegregated data so that we can target these people with interventions that are designed for them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Fafa Patricia. And uh, Elham is typing in the uh, side here that Ghana doesn't even have a definition of who a marginalized vulnerable person is, just to kind of reinforce your point. So thank you for that. Okay. Um, so now to Netbrite, Patricia, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Ellie. <laughs> I will try as much as possible not to repeat some of the things that my colleagues have said because uh, my, Papa has also taken some of the things out of my mouth. I'm going to talk about as the way forward. For instance, there is a stimulus package uh, for uh, the private sector. And one of the things that I think uh, we are going to do as NETRI, that's a women's rights organization, is to see uh, how and uh, work with the government to see how best, because there are no clear guidelines as to how this stimulus package is, is, go, uh, uh, is going to be done. So one of the things that is key for us as a women's rights organization is to ensure how we, uh, female SMEs uh, uh, will, be, uh, uh, will be targeted. And when I'm talking about SMEs, female SMEs, I'm also looking at the uh, women, uh, woman farmer. I'm looking at the market woman. I'm looking at women that have small uh, uh, businesses that they are handling. How are they going to be targeted so that these stimulus packages do not go to only male-led organizations and, and big uh, organizations? One of the things that this discussion has also brought up about is the fact about gender budgeting. And already one of the things that NetRight is doing is to uh, push in. Uh, mm -hmm demanding from government on how best they would put in transparent systems uh, uh, to ensure that we are able to track uh, uh, public funds uh, to support uh, gender equality. So I think one of the things that we'll do also with NetRat as a network and also with our members is how MDAs are revising their budgets and plans to address COVID-19 and fallout with specific uh, emphasis on how they are addressing uh, impacts on women's uh, livelihoods and impacts on, on girls. And there are issues around frontline workers. And I think it's also good. Uh, if I mentioned about CSOs, one of the things that I've realized during this week of COVID is that the government has met some key uh, groups, but CSOs are missing. And especially for me coming from a women's rights uh, movement, uh, women's, uh, uh, the women's rights mo uh, women's movement is making out of all this um, discussion. Since government started engaging different groups, they've not engaged uh, uh, the women's movement so that our voice, uh, it, 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 we make sure so our voice are part uh, of the process. So one of the things I think has not right. And uh, we, we have to do is to find ways of also meeting the government to ensure that our voice, and when I talk about our voice, I'm talking about the voice of women uh, uh, as part of these interventions that are being 
uh, put, uh, put out there to ensure that um, the agenda is responsive and they meet specific needs uh, of women, especially vulnerable women in this situation. That it's also a uh, stigmatization, yes, is a big issue. And I think one of the things that we should do, and also through our members, because our members are in the communities, is uh, carrying out an extensive education on uh, addressing uh, stigmatization. There are issues around frontline workers. Majority of them are, are women. So uh, that's a way forward. Uh, we have to also see how best we can even engage with them. Uh, health professionals, the, uh, the nurses association, to find out how best uh, some of these frontline uh, workers uh, can be addressed. I'm coming from a, uh, I'm a labor. I used to be a labor person. So when you touch uh, workers, then uh, it's kind of also bothered. But the issue about pregnancy, yes, we have to talk um, to women, but then it's also important even to study their situations because Bash said that. Um, all women do have similar experiences with pregnancy. I have staff that I have to intentionally be angry to get them to stop working because I see that uh, they are preg heavily pregnant and they are still pushing their cells and I intentionally would be angry so that they stop working. They minimize what they are doing. So the, so the situations are different. So whilst talking to them, yes, but it's also important to study the different situations because you can't relate to each of them the same way. Yeah. So that we know how best uh, we, we can address uh, some of these issues. So these are some few thoughts that I want to share as a way forward. Has not tried what we would want to uh, do. Uh, has not tried. Thank you. Elaine, you're mute. mute. Ah, okay. Yeah. Thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Trisha, and thank you for sharing also the uh, the, the the really great work of the NetRight Net uh, organization. Um, all the excellent points, Bash, that we've been hearing today. Um, as we're closing up now, I mean, I, I what I hear is um, obviously a lot of concerns around the gendered impacts of the of the moment we're in, um, and the pandemic seems to be also laying bare. Some, some serious gaps in terms of policy and practice um, that can ensure the, uh, the, uh, the protection of the most marginalized. Um, we haven't even really discussed uh, in any great detail um, you know, what happens with persons with disabilities in a, in a moment like this, um, and, and um, amongst others as well, um, those that are displaced um, in, in various spaces. Um, the, we've talked a little bit at the beginning around impacts around um, farmers and it, it, we pretty much touched on almost every sector it sounds like. Um, and it strikes me that for the graduates that are on the call here that hearkening uh, uh, back to the, the learning that you've had on citizen-led asset-based community development at this moment is um, yeah. is even more critical than maybe you realized when you were at the Cody and doing your various programs. Um, we are um, at, at Cody um, in, in calls like this and um, in, in hearing from our graduates, realizing, of course, all of the challenges that are out there, challenges that uh, some are unique to the, the countries uh, in which you are, you're living. And, uh, but oftentimes there are similar challenges across the board um, with other countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. But what, what we're also hearing is the incredible innovation that is happening um, and the, the rise of community mobilizing in, in ways that uh, are also really incredible, notwithstanding some of the challenges that were, that were uh, talked about, like stigmatization and so on. Um, it's clear that uh, that the that the COVID nineteen will bring out both the best and the worst of what we what we have as as communities and as societies. So, Bash, I'm turning it back to you. Are there any last comments that you'd like to make um, from what you've heard? And then maybe we can um, encourage people at the end also to be sharing more comments um, as they can um, via email as well to us, and we'll make sure that everybody gets those. Bash, over to you for a final comment. Um, I'd like to say a very big thank you. Myself, Ilham, Prof is not here, but she will definitely listen in on the conversation um, when it is shared. Uh, thank you everyone for the input. This is not 
not going to be the end. I mean, we've got gotten a lot of ideas on what our community uh, collective action should look like. Is everyone in on? Uh, myself, Elham, and Prof will set to look at two very important issues that we probably need to start a social media campaign on and then uh, get back to the whole team. And if there's need for us to have another uh, Zoom conversation on the next steps, because we've gotten a lot of ideas, we could also choose one of the main issues as a topic for discussion again in our next session. So thank you to everyone and especially to Ilham for the force and the power that she puts behind this. And finally, I also want to, I, I saw someone make a comment, I've forgotten who did, about the positive impact of um, this COVID pandemic by letting parents spend more time with their children. Myself and Elham had a very, uh, we had a conversation about this, about the fact that I don't remember the last time I spent three whole weeks with my kids, but here I am with them for a very long time and I'm getting to know them better who they are and who they are not and how strong, stronger they are than me. So it's also another positive thing. And for us in our own small ways, we should make sure that we continue talking about, especially the issue of childcare, because we've all recognized how important it is, especially in this time that women have to go to work, they have to take care of their kids, because even our constitution failed women. The constitution gave the role of child uh, caring to women and left the fathers of the hook. So these are some of the things we also in our own small ways have to look at to make sure that all the policies and programming and planning are very responsive and help Netrite and other groups to also be part of the discussions on the table. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you so much, Bash. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, you'll get a copy of this recording as well as the notes that were in the group chat um, sometime uh, in the next day or so. You'll also be encouraged to share with us um, your feedback. We'll do a small evaluation form as part of that. So we would love to hear from you all. Um, and again, thank you to Bash, Elham, and Professor um, for leading this off. And you heard it here first. It's not the end of the discussion in Ghana. Let's continue and uh, Cody is here to support you along the way as, as you need it. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.